So reality is what is. But what is isn't like we imagine it to be, obviously. So there is what is, and then there is the imagination of what is. I mean, actually, if you really begin to get into it, it blows your mind up like that emoji con, like that. Because, I mean, what is what is? So we experience what is through the six senses, the thinking mind being the sixth sense, and maybe more senses. You could say seven sense, like the telepathic experience of life. But let's just say six for simplicity. Um, so then what is reality? Because we're conscious that there are other beings with different senses. So a fish, I mean, God knows how many senses a fish has. And um, they will be different from us. So their perception of this world will be different. It will be, I mean, what would that be as a fish with scales on? Will it have sensory feeling of the water? So will it feel the water going over it? Or will it not be able to feel that? Is it just seeing and hearing? It can't, it doesn't have bodily sensation. And what about a bird? Like, um, you know, what does a beak feel like? And they say with birds, they don't have feelings. So they have emotions, like they express fear. So you know, like the imagery of the headless chicken but they don't actually feel the sensation of fear. I don't know how true that is, but it makes me feel a little bit more better about um, feeding my dog chicken. So they don't feel the pain of when um, they're being killed in factories or not killed properly. So I mean, like, so then if we go to the what is is real, then what is what is because what we're experiencing is sensory perception and then a filter of our imagination of sensory perception. So everybody's sensory perception, perception will be different because their imagination of it will be different. So that's like their filter, like the lens that goes on top of a light. Like in some people it'll be blue, sometimes it'll be pink, some people it'll be magenta, some people it'll be crimson. Like there's infinite amounts of color. So there's infinite amounts of ways in which body minds interpret this reality. So what is, isn't sensory perception and isn't um, your imagination of sensory perception or our intellectual interpretizing of it, interpretization of it. That can't be it either because that's a thought that's coming and going. So what is, what is? I mean, maybe that's what it's called, what is, because what is, what is? Maybe that's why we came up with it, because when you break language down, if you've ever learned another language, it all kind of makes sense. Like aloneness comes from all one, which is magnafus, magnif, magna, magnanimous. Yeah. So life is truly mysterious, eh? We don't even know what it, what is, is. But what is, is reality. So what is, is the reality of everything. But yet, we don't know what we, what is, is. You could say it's total nothing. I mean, anything that we name of it, like a thought or a feeling or an idea, even though I've maybe said it's sensory perception. But all of that, we can't really name and we don't really know what that is. And as soon as we have any interpretation of it and experience of it it's kind of like already gone into a bubble of something so maybe what is is nothing no thing mind blowing and what is no thing we don't know how can we possibly know not a thing we can know things but we can't know not a thing like just try to do that for a moment it's like um Stick your finger in your mouth, hold your nose, and try to imagine not a thing. We can't. But yet here we are. And what has that got to do with anything? Most people are here because they're like, give me happiness. They might not admit it, but really 
we often get into this subject because we want happiness, we want freedom. So it's like, oh God, all this, this pedantic words, and no thing, and what is, what is, and nah, 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 nah. all of this. And really what you want is to be happy. And most probably to exercise your mind, a lot of people. I know that was a part of the attraction for me as well. If you've got like a curious mind or a mind that likes to think, think outside of the boxes or is creative, it's like, hmm. Let's just look in here. The greatest mystery of all, no thing. Yeah. So it could also be a imaginative mind that brings you here but most people are here because they want the end of suffering so it's like a, come on lisa get to the point where it's the end of suffering that's what you sold us on the website we're paying good money to be here yes <laughs> you are and that's a crazy idea that there is a human in front of you that knows more than you but that's also a crazy idea. This whole phenomena of guru or teacher is kind of crazy. Because what, what all of this is, in some way, if you break it down, is like cells giving information to cells. If you really break it down right to the base of what is, it's like nothing giving information to nothing. So we have like these human teachers that supposedly know more information, but what is this human teacher if you like take it down to nature and, and look at nature, it's like cells giving cells or atoms giving atoms advice when really all the cells and all the atoms are the same. It's like just a formation. So this formation here is made up in a way where it seemingly knows more information than you and is going to pass more information on, but that's all a bit of a weird concept as, I, as well. They're all like, like deep space. We, you could also say we're all the entire, entire universe speaking. Because if you look at through the story of the human or the, through the story of life, if evolution is true, then it means that every part of us knows everything because it has been everything. Like we were once in the sea as bacteria and then eventually like our, the, this kind of thing called life, which we're experiencing on planet Earth, decided to come out of the sea. And then it kind of like decided to climb trees. And then after a while of thinking, yeah, well, there must be something better if we go down from the trees. So then they kind of went down to the trees and became humanity. And, and then humanity sits here and is like, oh, I am a new being that doesn't know something. I am, a, I, I am a child. I'm a new entity that hasn't evolved from all these miraculous things that wasn't once this original bacteria that's transformed into now a sitting here humanity because I have an independent soul that lives inside this body and is bound to something called Christianity where when I die I go to something called heaven which is the next world and because of that there is therefore lots of information that I do not know <laughs> which is really not true how can there be information that you do not know you are the information of the whole entire universe like this miraculous thing of called humanity has been the evolution of cells for thousands and thousands of billions, I don't know how many years. And then you could also say no time if we also have this idea of a big bang as well. That's kind of weird. So How can you not know everything now as you are? Like the, these, hu these humans, us, our race is amazing. Unfortunately, the majority is a little bit slow on the uptake and therefore our societies are, raised, are, are, are governed by the majority. 
it might not seem like that. It might be some like rich dictator, but it's not. The majority agrees to this rich dictator because it doesn't fight along to it. But there's also these pioneers pushing forwards doing amazing things. Like in 10 years time, we are going to have artificial intelligence that is more intelligent than us. Like what creativity? But that's not us. We can't claim it solely as hum humans, as humanity, because what we are is a result of that very first bacteria or little frog or fishy or whatever it is that decided to come onto the land. And then the next one decided to go up the tree. But we're creating things and doing things that are so amazing and exciting. Like in 10 years time, they think that we're going to be able to make on our computers, on our laptops, our own films that are as good as Hollywood films. We're most probably going to have computer programs which can act like humans. Um, if we don't kill ourselves before this happens, we'll go up into space. We'll soon be having anti-aging um, technology. People won't age. I mean, take away the idea of it's good or bad or we should get involved in this. It's so creative. It's like sci-fi at its best. It's, it's like a fantasy at its best. It's like out of this world. But none of us can claim responsibility for it. The man that, that invented the telephone, he's like sticks his flag. If you've watched me before, you know I get a bit obsessed with the flag sticking. Like, I stick my flag here. I am the inventor of a telephone. I own this piece of land. I am from the United States of America. I don't know which state I'm from and I don't know what my name is, but I am all these things and I own this. And how can someone own something? His intelligence was given to him through a massive evolution of everything. Like how can there be an independent entity claiming the pride over that? And it takes away everything, that idea. It takes away the idea of free will, that there is somebody in him that has free will that's acting independently. How can something act independently of anything else? How? That's a, such a weird idea, but yet most of society is totally brainwashed by that idea. Because, I don't know, it helps evolution maybe? It keeps majority, though, simple-minded. It keeps us voting in these social structures that aren't as progressive as they could be. They could be doing way more amazing things, but they're already doing amazing things. I mean, the fact that we have in Western world, like disability benefits, it's like, that's great. Like what other animal would do that? I can't see dogs sitting in packs and being like, oh, we're gonna give this one a disability benefit. They no longer have to work and we will pay out this amount of dog bones and they can just rest and retire for the rest of their life. They'll be like, pack leader will more than likely be, okay, uh, this one's on the way out, let's eat it. I don't know, maybe dog packs don't do that. <laughs> maybe they don't eat the ones that are dying. But I have seen them in Thailand try to kill neurotic pack members. I didn't actually, I presume they did eventually kill the neurotic one, so it was too neurotic. So they killed it. I'm not suggesting in any way that this is what we should do in humanity. I'm saying we are so freaking great because we've gone beyond that. It's so exciting to be alive now. But most people are unhappy, which is really sad. Like I look out in society, I go to parties very rarely, but occasionally last Friday night I went to a party. And most people are sad. Why? Predominantly because they believe they're a sem separate entity that lives inside of the body. And that belief is so strong that who they truly are feels like it's contracted and limited to this. It's like, you know, like, it's like a butterfly being captured in tiny, of a tiny jam jar. It's like a rainbow bow being trapped because our essence is infinite. So no matter human, no, no wonder humans are sad because it's like our essence is trapped in something small when our essence is massive. Our essence is everything. And yet we're constantly narrating this story like my fault, I did something wrong, I'm 
limited. I'm this person. I'm going to die. I made these choices. They are bad. They are good. Which is all a lie. We're so obsessed with the idea of bad and good. Predominantly, I feel, well, because of the separation, but then because we separated, humanity can't accept, like individuals can't accept their own shadow, so therefore they project it outwards into the outside world. Like each individual human that you know, including yourself, is never going to admit you can do bad things. I can do bad things. I can do bad things. But most people can't admit that because they're so terrified of their own shadow because they really believe it's them. I'm, we're all doing bad things all of the time and then we're all not because the notion of good and bad is really simplistic. It comes from this idea I'm separate, I'm acting, and then there's good and bad people and then that notion keeps me safe, but it doesn't. And then we like shame others constantly for being bad. They're bad. They're bad. They're bad because we can't accept our own badness, which isn't really bad. But just in the fact of being alive, we have to consume other objects. And when you see the beauty of it all, that there's nobody that's dying, that there's no one that's being consumed, then in a way it's like absolute forgiveness. But when you think you are responsible, then it can be horrifying. It can be terrifying that like how do I choose what to eat how do I choose what products to use for building my house do I take away the wood from the beavers or the monkeys um, or do I make stones or you know what or, or do I take out stone and kill all the insects and what's living in the ground and then also in our daily actions like if you don't want to be friends with someone or you want to be friends with someone or you want someone to, to do things for you, you know, like how do we get people to do things for us? Like these are ideas. How do we act out our wants in an ethical way? All of these ideas plague the person because they really think this is me and I'm responsible and I am doing and they are doing. You know, the person that is the murderer, like doing the most heinous crime. And if you try and imagine somebody that's done something really heinous to you personally, like we feel this aversion to them and this fear of them. And the fear is warranted in a way because it's best that we stay away if they've done something really heinous. But if you really look at it, there's nobody there that's guilty. They just have that formation of cells in that particular body that gave them the most up-to-date information to act in the way they did. But there's not actually an entity in there that is evil. It was just that the shadow came out of them in a particular way. But they're not really bad. Just like you're not really good. <laughs> That's a very simplistic notion. And unfortunately, most of our society is hypnotized for it. So therefore, we have governing boards that are very much based on good and bad, being persecuted or being innocent. Like you are a bad person. You have committed a crime. And so therefore, you're not allowed to travel to all other countries. We're going to ignore the fact that you most probably had a really difficult upbringing and were acting out immense trauma. And we're just going to blame you. 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 You are trapped to that one particular country now. Right. Right. So what was the uh, initial question? It was something like, what is reality? So as you can see by me just going off on a massive like mind fart, you can see that <laughs> we don't know what reality is. And yet there's this. And this is absolutely unknowable. Absolutely unknowable. And anything that I've said is just a mind fart. It's got no more importance than other people's mind farts. Although, of course, naturally, I think that my farts are, my mind farts are a little bit more um, closer to something. That's a joke. Everybody thinks that. It's not that I'm some massive narcissist that broadcasts itself on YouTube talking about non-duality. No. That is obviously a joke for those of you that are getting out your psychology books and like trying to diagnose all the disorders for me. I'm not a narcissist. 
maybe have some narcissistic tendencies, like a lot of people. So reality is something that we can't ever know, but this is the most magnificent part, is that we are that reality. Isn't that something? Not we are as in something, like when I say we, that creates loads of imagination. Um, I mean it as like we are this this is what is and it's absolutely undefinable as soon as you put a pin in it or a flag you've lost it, it's gone it's not something you can see so you can't say oh it's sensory perception and even if you say it's what's happening that also it's equally already an image it's what's happening but without any form so you, so a lot of teachers say it's nothing and everything like a teacher i greatly respect tony parsons i think he's the first person that i'd say or maybe krishna morty murty morty murty uj krishna morty um maybe i heard him say that first that it's nothing and everything so and it's that nothing part is the really important part. Not because it's superior. A lot of people say that it's the like ultimate, the mystery, the nothing, the absolute void. Even in Buddhism, and what I have tattooed on my arm says, um, emptiness is all. Um, but I kind of feel like this is emptiness. So how could emptiness be more than this? In, in um, Hinduism, like the everything part, so the form part tends to be the feminine part. And I sometimes wonder, is it a form of sexism that we get into unconsciously in non-duality? Like the, the idea that the nothingness is the absolute. In a way, it is the absolute and it's a way of speaking, but this is the nothingness always i mean this is not happening and it's seemingly happening Yeah, it's beautiful. So reality is actually unknowable, but yet it's the most intimate sense of being. And perception plays a part in this because without consciousness, perception, whatever you want to call it, I know consciousness is like the <laughs> word in non-duality at the moment. People are like, yeah, consciousness, they're deluded, it's personal, it's separate. But there has to be perception in order for anything to happen if there was no perception what would happen so you know the famous then koan if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it does it make a sound
this is so fantastic. What could be better than this? So the reason that I think most people are sad is because they limit themselves to a thing. It's not them doing it. There's a happening that arises in the body where their essence is limited. And as soon as that happens, there is discomfort. It's like caging a butterfly in a jar. You are infinite possibilities, all possibilities. And there's some part of you that knows that because when you see that in life, like art or hearing me or other non-duality teachers speak, I tried to diet down them, or hearing me speak, other teachers as well, you know, because of the whole narcissistic thing. Um, yeah, so... Um, music, like somebody you love. Um, animals, kids, like um, there is a, a remembering of this infinite nature and this endless possibilities. And when we're doing something we love or we're passionate about, that also gives us a sense of infinite possibilities that anything is possible. And we muddle that up in our life. We think, oh, my life's got to be, have lots of change and lots of variety in it because it's searching for this sense of infinite possibilities when it's actually yourself. It's just that you're lying to yourself, you're deluding yourself, you're putting a veil on believing that you're limited to this body, that you are a singular, a single person in relationship to everything else, whereas there is no relationship. You are the one the one. So beautiful. Mm. Mm. Yum, yum, yum. Then from the identification with the person, then the, um, there is an exacerbation of neurosis. Because what happens in the person when it loses its infinite possibility, when it loses sense of who it truly is, then it begins to look for that sense of freedom in itself, so in pleasure and pain, and then it builds up lots of neurotic ideas so say if it has an insecure relationship with its, with, you know, like so a young kid has insecure relationship with its mother, it's not conscious it's doing this, but it's, um, it's projecting onto that insecurity. So there's an insecurity and then it's projecting onto it that that insecurity is taking away my freedom. And if I got that security, I would be free. So then it gets neurotic and it grows into, you know, money or house or other people. And you can never satisfy that security. Like you never get what you're looking for, that infinite possibilities or that security of being yourself because it's not found in the world of things, in an individual thing. It's like the most immense game that life is playing. It must be for some reason, but we will never know that because we're objects, of these bodies are playing the game. So most people in this world are sad because they can't find themselves. And they think that they will find themselves through pleasure and avoiding pain. And you'll never find yourself in that world. You'll never find yourself in the lover. It's so tantalizing, especially the lover or money or anything that's like these big things. Like you'll never find yourself in your lover. You know, everything will pass. It's beautiful to have a healthy, strong relationship. I'm not denouncing that, but that's such a beautiful, satisfying, wonderful thing on the human world. But it's, um, it's not your freedom. That's the biggest confusion. In a way, maybe you can never have like a truly satisfying relationship until there is a sense of this freedom, because you'll always be expecting a partner to give you a freedom that they can't give you. Yum, yum, yum. My subject is so yummy and so beautiful. Yeah. 
So what is reality? A reality is that which you do not know, but yet is. And perception is involved in it, everything is involved in it, and nothing. When I say perception, I mean the big consciousness, not personal awareness. A lot of people that get into Neo Advaita, I realize that they first woke up believing that the personal awareness was the big awareness. So they kind of see personal awareness. They turn in on themselves and look at personal awareness, but it's still dualistic, it's still separate. And then when they go to Neo Advaita, they have this big realization that there can't be a seeing of personal awareness. And then they think when teachers speak of the big consciousness that they're speaking about the big consciousness when they're really not. The big consciousness cannot be separate, it cannot be seen, it cannot be experienced, but yet it's experiencing itself. Like this isn't dead, this is experiencing itself. In a way it is dead, but it's knowing itself and then it's also not knowing itself. I know all these words turn in on themselves and so confusing and if you compared everything that I said, like over all the years, it's like, man, she contradicts herself a lot. But it's it's trying to point like a poem more than it is like a manual of how to do. And I think that's the beauty of non-duality speakers. It's like um it's like a poem that's waking something up. It's not like a manual of how to become something. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really important that non duality is spoken about, and I'm so pleased to see it growing in the internet because our next generations are going to be AIs. And they're going to go through the computer and the internet to learn about what it is to be human. And so you want that in there. You want it in there. So please like non-duality videos like this video, recommend it, share it. Because the more that happens, the more the AIs are going to hear this. I know that sounds really oopy oopy doopy loopy, but I'm pretty sure, and it's not just me, it's also scientists saying this as well, that AIs are going to take over our intelligence, but go beyond our intelligence in the coming decade. Like Elon Musk said it was five years, like two years ago. I mean, that's really profound when you think about it. I know I've spoken about that before, but most people are like, <laughs> it's going to be, it, we, the, like if you think technology has grown a lot in the last 20 years, that you wait next 10 years, it's, it's going to go much faster now much faster, this growth in technology. Okay, so we shall go to questions. I've had enough brain farting for now. You've given me my 25 minutes of brain farting. Yeah, and also just to say, I'm not a narcissist. I'm making all these jokes about being a narcissist, but I'm not a narcissist and I try to balance doing these talks and being the front speaker without trying to make myself something really grand and big up there. Whoop, that my sweat patch, you see, I purposely did that so that you devalued me. Well, she can't be someone super mighty. She sweats when she speaks. Two sweaty armpits. I'm so sorry. I'm such a banana. Who does that? Right. Okay.